welcome to Godless Bitches. I am your host, Claire Wollner, and with me today, Jen Peoples. Hey, everybody. Hey. And Tracy Harris. Howdy. Right on. And Godless Bitches 2.0 is a production of the Atheist Community of Austin, an educational nonprofit dedicated to the separation of government and religion and the promotion of positive atheist culture. Um, also, if you wouldn't mind hitting that subscribe button as you're watching, that would be awesome. Uh, so... What's going on, ladies? What's new? There's lots in the news, actually. <laughs> it's a little yes, tough it's being a, a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, it doesn't. It's not. You know, we're not partisan. It's it's just an issue. It's the issues. I know for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Uh, there's something else I was gonna say. Oh, I have some exciting news. I have contacted Callie Wright. Mm. Mm-hmm. And she's going to be on the show, uh, the, uh, the January show, so the first Saturday in January. That awesome. will be cool. with Callie Wright. If you don't know who Callie Wright is, find her. She is hands down my favorite podcaster. Um, what she does for the world is amazing, and I admire everything that she has done. So having her on the show is going to be just a dream come true for me. It's going to be great. And I asked her specifically because she put a call out on Facebook. Uh, well, actually, this was it was on Facebook, but it was also in her podcast saying, what are you going to do? Because the trans community is under attack, under, under attack, not with your, what you're comfortable with. What are you going to do? And I said, I've got this platform. Would you want to... Let Avail us, yourself of it. Yeah, yes. amplify yeah. your voice. And she said, yes. So I am going to ask the same of you. Trans rights are under attack. And what are you going to do? Um, this is important. People's lives are at risk. So, and any, there, was, there was a lot in the news about this. Do you all have stuff to bring about that? Um, I, I mean, one of the things that, um, that Trump, did almost immediately uh, started really last summer mm -hmm. um, not not this most recent but 2017 right after he took office it, you know he was reviewing the policy of allowing trans service members to serve openly mm -hmm. and and of course it was the usual talking points about well you know um, there's the medical costs and all this stuff. and the medical costs are negligible I mean we spend more on Viagra for you know, heterosexual men than we do, you know, on uh, trans care. Mm -hmm. Everything included. And, and, and even the projections for what it would cost are, are not, um, it's, it's not anything that we don't have the capability to do in the military. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, there was, it, it, the military itself, they were just kind of baffled, like, where did this come from? This was a settled issue. But this is, he, you know, he's throwing stuff out to the base that is, you know, very fearful of people who are different. And that's something that we're seeing over and over again with certain segments. Um, and this, is, this it kind of transcends even what we typically think of as like the partisan divide. Mm -hmm. It's not even about Democrats and Republicans anymore. This is We're talking about open um, nationalists out there mm -hmm. who are, are, are saying, hey, you know, if, if you're not one of us, mm -hmm. you know, we don't care about you. We want to erase you. Mm -hmm. And I, I think right now we need to recognize this attack on the trans community for what it is. Um, this is the canary in the coal mine, guys. Um, there have been several canaries. Yeah, this is, mm. you know, if we don't come at this hard, it will expand to other demographics. It's already expanding to other demographics. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the, um, we had, uh, excuse me, <coughs> we had Jewish people massacred in a, in a synagogue in the United States this past week mm -hmm. by a self-identified white nationalist. Mm -hmm. Who was saying anti-Semitic things right. as he was committing the act. Right. Who said anti-Semitic things to the doctors who were treating him at the hospital. You know, 
um, it, 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 if you had told me this was going to happen, you know, five years ago, I would have told you that you need to get out more. Mm-hmm. This is like the stuff of some dystopian novel that, mm-hmm. you know, and here it is playing out in the United States. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I I have a, an opinion that I'm not sure if I, I've... I've heard a lot of folks say uh, that they're glad that um, all of this has come to past, past because you know who you're dealing with then. Uh, the people who are bigots and awful, they will proclaim who they are vociferously. There's no mm-hmm. mystery about who's on your side and who's not. I get that. I I wonder, this is the opinion that I'm not sure if it's well-founded or not. I wonder if it's actually worse that they've been given the push. Was it better when they were feeling like what they believed was something that needed to be, I don't know if ashamed is the right word, but at least... Not they knew it was socially unacceptable. Yeah, and I think it's a. I think you're right. I think there's a. The, there are two edges to that sword, mm-hmm. right? So on the one hand, you're bold enough to be, you know, marching without your hoods now, because there's an environment that you feel is inviting to those attitudes. Yeah, which is what brings it out, mm-hmm. and you also risk other people who may not be so dedicated to it thinking it's more acceptable because look at how open you can be about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and look at how it's, you know, it's on the streets and there's all these people that support it and there's and so you do get in some ways it almost looks like because people are more emboldened it lends legitimacy to it right in the minds of some. Mm-hmm. And at the same time I do understand that you know, especially like just on a personal level I think the undercurrent of racism and bigotry in the country was well beyond what I understood. And I think that there were a lot of people that were confronting it sort of in on their own personal situations who were just, you know, kind of came out to say, this surprises you. Why? Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. w- w- what did you think was happening? Because mm-hmm. we were seeing it all the time. And, and this goes to those those contexts, right, that we've talked about in past shows where people live a context. And I think the example I gave was like this weird extrapolated thing of the the person who has more than one child and one is claustrophobic and they punish them in the closet. Right. You know, they put them in a small a walk-in closet and let them sit and do their timeouts in there. It's not like putting them in a cabinet or a trunk or something. It's like a, a large room where they can sit, but it's still a smaller room than normal. And if one child is claustrophobic and you ignore that context and just keep telling yourself, I'm treating my children equally, you're kidding yourself Mm -hmm. because you are horrifying, traumatizing, terrifying one of your kids and the other kid gets to sit and contemplate what they've done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not at all treating them the same. You're doing the same thing to them, but because you're not willing to look at the context because, hey... I don't see claustrophobia. I'm claustrophobia blind, right? (laughs) Yeah. And that makes me, you know, fair to claustrophobic people. It's like, no, it makes you completely abusing this child, right? um, That has claustrophobia, and you and and so uh, I think it was um, Serafina was on talking about that sort of weird aspect of of the book um, that she was talking about, where she said this is racist if somebody says it's racist, like if somebody in the group says it's racist. And then she went on to describe what what I just said, basically, the idea that they're telling you that in the context of what they deal with on an everyday racial level, Mm -hmm. this is levied at them all the time in a racist way. And even though you may not understand that the person is terrified in the closet and that some Mm -hmm. people do that to them on purpose because they hate people who are claustrophobic and they want to terrorize them. Mm -hmm. When you sit there and say, well, I'm not closing them in the closet in order to terrorize them. 
I'm trying to help them learn something. <laughs> I just, you know, right. I'm only doing it so they yeah. can contemplate what they've done. Mm-hmm. You still have to understand that that what you're doing is exactly the same thing as the person who's trying to terrorize them and puts them in a closet because they just hate claustrophobic people and want to terrorize claustrophobic mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. So you contribute to the problem by tr- by ignoring the fact that you're dealing with somebody who has a individual context that affects makes this different for them. Yeah. than it is to the other children. Yeah. You know, and when you fail to acknowledge that, when you when you when you when you're when it's brought to your attention and you still make no effort to adjust it, then then that is a racist thing to do. Very. Right? Yeah. And when you're talking about is like trans issues, it, it, and Jen was saying it applies across the board. It's like you can do this to anyone. You have to make the effort to understand the context of who you're dealing with. Mhm. Yeah, I mean, I, I got into a conversation. Um, well, I, I I actually just kind of lurked and read the conversation, but it was kind of appalling because there was someone who was making an assertion that, well, this PC culture has gone too far. We've oh, heard God. that over and over again. Yeah, and you know, by PC, what he really meant was considering how this looks from the perspective of someone else who does not have the same privileges that mm-hmm. you know the that speaker had. They need to see it like I see it. And it's not being PC in that situation, even though PC has become kind of a slur. Mm -hmm. Um, But being PC in that situation means considering another person, Mm -hmm. basically extending human empathy to this person. And that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And how do you go too far with empathy? You know, is there such a thing? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he still did not get it. It, And what I see over and over again is that people who don't want to make the effort to understand another person's perspective fall back on this. Well, this has just gone too far. And so now we have atheist organizations who, you know, they want to get women on their panels to talk about whether the Me Too movement has gone too far or something like that, you know. Yeah. But, yes, so. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So what are you you noticing or what did you talk to um, regarding, like, specific issues within what's what's going on in the trans community? Well, um, you mean with, with... Cali? Right. I mean, like, well, for example, right. we were just talking about the synagogue, and you know, that's like mm-hmm. a recent development, <laughs> right? The, yeah. The the well, for one thing, um, what she has talked about is um, just the erasure of of trans people. Right. Um, the other thing that I talked to her about was uh, we really actually messaged back and forth, but uh, I also host Parenting Beyond Belief, and I asked her if she would be willing to come on that show and talk to uh, the audience and hopefully parents about what it's like to grow up different Mm -hmm. and what parents and other adults can do that is appropriate, helpful, loving, kind. Um, She's lived it, and Mm -hmm. so she can give that experience. Uh, So those were the two primary things. Um, I... I, I, the elections have happened at this point when this is broadcast. I hope it's it's been a good election. Well, <laughs> it's kind of weird to tape something before something big happens. Um, and I hope that when we talk with Callie, there's there's some good news that comes with the elections. I don't know if it will happen. Um. I wanted to dovetail on something you just said, Jen, and I'm not sure if I'm going to remember it. Um, <laughs> rats. I hate when my brain does this. Uh, dang it, dang it. I guess I'll try to remember it. I'm sorry. Go on. All right. Well, you were talking about erasure, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, uh, I'm just thinking in terms of what we had mentioned before we started the podcast, like the erasure at the at the synagogue situation. Oh, oh gosh. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the media was saying that it was anti-religious. Well, I think it was an anti-religious. Um, I, specifically, I, I well, heard yeah, it, was, it from Kellyanne Conway. Yeah, and then, Kellyanne uh, Conway, Someone right. else told me or posted and said that they had heard it from AG Sessions. 
and I don't know how if if any other pundits were saying this, but I I happened to catch you know catch Kelly and Conway talking mm-hmm. and was just my jaw dropped. I did too when when I saw that. I was, you got to be kidding me! Yeah. Oh my yeah. God! The, the anti-Semitism yeah. was explicit. It right. was the reason for it. It was not anti-religious. It was anti-Semitic, and there's a huge difference. Uh, the Jewish faith and the Jewish culture has been the victim of so much oppression over the years for so long, and then to just write it off this horrific incident as anti-religious, like, oh, you know, you're you're part of our club now. Oh, God, no. Yeah, and I mean, it, that whole comment by Kellyanne Conway was so dripping with irony because, I mean, how many... Um, how many Jewish people have we um, had in the atheist communities, you know, kind of writ large mm-hmm. over the years? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, okay. atheism is kind of pretty common in Jewish culture because mm-hmm. um, yeah. you can be culturally Jewish mm-hmm. and not actually believe that a God exists. Mm-hmm. Right. And you can be religious and anti-Semitic. Yes. Yes. And sure. and so the idea that this is so, sort of an anti-religion thing when, you know, we, we sit here in the ACA and it's like there are Jews among us, mm-hmm. you know, they identify as Jewish um, and they're atheists. Mm-hmm. And, and I haven't ever heard anybody have a problem with that. So here's the quote. She said, the anti-religiosity in this country that is somehow in vogue, making fun of people who express religion, the late-night comedians, the unfunny people who go go on TV, it's always anti-religious, she said, um, invoking the 2015 fatal shooting of nine black parishioners in Charleston, South Carolina by a white supremacist. (laughs) These people were gunned down in their place of worship, she said, of both the Charleston victims and those of of Saturday's, this was the synagogue shooting, before concluding, the shootings were a sign that, quote, this is no time to be driving God out of the public square. So what she was doing was taking the anti-Semitic sentiment and the racist sentiment, and she's lumping it together, and she's saying it's not about anti-Semitism. It's not about anti-black. This is about um, anti-religion. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm being oppressed too, mm-hmm. right, because this is this is God-haters doing this. And this, mm-hmm. isn't, this wasn't a racist in Charleston that did this because of race, and this wasn't an anti-Semitic person who did this in Pittsburgh because of they don't like Jews. This was just about God-haters doing this and people who make fun of religion doing this. And, and um, you know, let's, let's be claustrophobia blind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and and this is uh, the the real sickness of it is that the reason the shooters chose those places is because those are the the safe places for black people and Jews. Well, there's a reason they call it a congregation. Right. Right. Well, right. Right. So, yeah. the, the reason there. a lot of yeah. black people have a hard time leaving their religion, and this is, uh, thank you to, to Mandisa for helping raise my awareness on, on this, is because um, it's cultural. That's what you have as a community. That was your safe place. Um, white people have taken damn near everything else away. They still have their church, and so they can get together, and that is their safe place. And that was ripped from them. And then the same with the Jewish faith. So much has been taken away. They have the synagogue where they can go and be at peace together. And that's been taken away. That was taken advantage of by this person. It had nothing to do with the religion. It was opportunity and a really disturbed, sick one. I just... Well, I have to wonder if Kellyanne Conway thinks that the church bombing in Birmingham um, was anti-religion, or was that just a racist, you know, Klan member who decided to bomb the church there and kill four little girls? And she's going to call yeah. it whatever is to her. Yeah, I, I think that yeah. the, the fact that they can pin it on anti-religiosity mm-hmm. and then lump in their evangelicals. Mm-hmm. Um, and say, yeah, this is against us all. We're mm-hmm. all, you know, yeah, th- this is exactly. us against the atheists, basically, mm-hmm. or the an- the anti, 
atheist, eighth atheist specifically right. is what yeah. she's aiming at. And Which, I know a lot of atheists, a lot, a lot, and I know you all do too. We're not shooting places up. Right. No, m- many atheists uh, adopt humanism as, yeah. as like a your, philosophy yeah, of like right? ethics. We're, so. we're not out to get anybody. We're not out to... I'm try- I, I sat there just dumbfounded thinking, and, and where is the history of atheist anti-Semitism in the United States? Like, where is that? Yeah. Right. Because the only anti-Semitism has been through religious groups. Right. Um, you right. Know, this country has no history of, of, like, an atheist movement that <laughs> was anti-Semitic. I mean, I, maybe someone can prove me wrong. Like, they'll go on Google and find some weird atheist movement. Yeah, that but the fact that you have to look I don't know. for it but says it, but a lot. You know, it's like this is... You know, huge swaths of anti-Semitism come out of the the Jesus killing Jew mar- narrative, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, and I, it, it just it stunned me. I mean, I, in a million years, I was like, I, in some ways, I don't know. Maybe I should be impressed with the creativity of that narrative that she came up with because it was so I'm weirdly impressed twisted. Impressed with the audacity to just put that right out there, at, you know, without even. Blinky. I mean, she never broke character the whole time. Yeah, but this is erasure, right? This is erasing the Jews. This wasn't right. against Jews. It wasn't yeah. about Jews. Um, this was about people that don't like God. And, mm-hmm. and yeah. let's just, you know, get that well, majority. And I guess my next ease. question for her would be, well, if that's anti-religion, what's the Muslim ban all about if that's not anti-religion, you know? Yeah, just I mean, a little problem there. Yeah, but, you know. I'm sure there's, but oh, but that's a real threat. No. Well, there's also that strange relationship. God haters and their Muslim ban. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's that strange relationship <laughs> right. between fundamentalists and Zionism. Yeah. And so maybe Jews kind of get a little bit of a pass or something, whereas Muslim, oh, that's just completely bad. I don't, I don't know. But yeah. Except to say that it's flat out bigotry and racism yeah. and. Awful. It was new, though. I was just sort of surprised. On you know, on the one hand, I was mm-hmm. I was disgusted that somebody would try to say this wasn't about bigotry toward Jews, and on the other hand, I was kind of stunned, saying, "Wow!" So, what it kind of reminded me of, there was a lawyer that had posted an article during the whole Kavanaugh thing, right? Mm-hmm. And the article was. Um, basically saying, oh, maybe it was someone that looked like Kavanaugh. And he actually went the extra step to like identify a kid in the yearbook that he thought looked like Kavanaugh. Oh, so literally that. identifying yeah. a person. Uh-huh. And I remember reading it and thinking, you know, like the big WTF over my head. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the next thing that I was thinking was, can you imagine being that guy? And you wake up like, and what the? <laughs> yeah, this is your Facebook inbox, right? Like oh. you're going, why do, why do I have 120,000 you know, <laughs> oh. Facebook messages and why is my Twitter exploding? And, uh. and this is just some private dude, right? Yeah. So here he is being named as potentially the real you know, attempted rapist. Mm-hmm. And this is just a guy that woke up that morning. Yeah. And I'm sitting here watching the Conway thing and I'm like, how the heck did I become the person that shot up the synagogue, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how mm-hmm. how did I, how how have I, yeah. when did I become the, responsible for the anti-Semitism? When that, it's part of the narrative yeah. that they I'm are the kinda, in and we are the I'm out. I'm anti-anti-Semitism. Right. So this is really weird that yeah. suddenly I'm waking up and the atheist is responsible for this. And I'm like, mm-hmm. wow, yesterday I was kind of watching the, the back and forth about who was responsible and can we blame and is it the media is it the yeah. president is it and suddenly it's like no it's you and yeah. I'm like wait what yeah yeah so what? It's you're in me? front of the firing squad yeah <laughs> oops I, okay mm-hmm. it's me because I you know I call I just ask people to support their views right. on a talk show and yeah. I don't even I you yeah. know for the record don't don't go shoot anybody yeah and the the thing that yeah. is the don't most body stress- slam them don't beat them. You know, mm-hmm. don't uh, don't punch them. Mm-hmm. Don't hurt people like that just because mm-hmm. of a perspective or just because they agree with this show or, or disagree with this show. Or you know what I mean? I I don't want anybody to go out and hurt anybody. anybody no. Yeah. yeah. Or a journalist for that matter. Yeah. That I will whole, disavow yeah. violence across the board. Here, Absolutely. You know, in in these cases, and no, don't ever don't ever feel an urge to like you have to do physical harm to anybody um, who disagrees with the opinions expressed on this program. No. 
yeah, that that just should go without saying. Well, it should. And yes, and and the fact that <laughs> yeah. they they say these things is not the worst of it to me. The worst of it is that that basket of crap is picked up and held dear by people who want to otherize, and it's used as ammunition. And there is no way they will ever put down that basket of crap. They will believe that to their grave, no matter what we say, what data we present, nothing, nothing matters. Well, They'll it, just it, it, swallow it's, it. It's like what we were talking about um, earlier about how, you know, y- you tell something, somebody something unsavory that they don't want to believe and they deny that that's the truth. And then when you prove to them that, yes, this person actually said these things and it is as bad as what we just said, that then they decide, oh, but it's not so bad. Mm-hmm. And they don't change mm-hmm. anything. Yeah. I, I've had, like, in my head a, a sort of... First of all, one of the best ways to find out, like, like if you're looking for whether or not you should believe a thing or not. So when he puts a claim out and you're thinking, should I believe this claim? Okay, so mm-hmm. first of all, you're going to hear the claim, you're going to see what they're saying, and, you're, and they're going to promote their argument or whatever. The next thing you can do is go to a site that disputes it. And mm-hmm. see what they have to say. Mm-hmm. What are they saying? And, and is what they're saying make as much sense, more sense, not as much sense? You know, maybe the claim you're hearing is valid, mm-hmm. and you're just like, wow. So I'm seeing like a lot of fear-driven decision making happening in our culture right now. And so one of the things I started thinking was, okay, so first of all, to me, if you hear a claim and it's something that scares you, if it's something that's disturbing to you, the first thing you want to do is validate that this is actually happening. Okay, mm-hmm. so first of all, is the thing that the person is claiming really happening? Is, is this the case that this is occurring? The next thing is to ask yourself, okay, if this is occurring, what am I afraid of? Why, why does it make me afraid that this is occurring? Mm-hmm. What, why is this scary even if it's really happening? When somebody starts to list the things they think that this happening is going to result in, the next thing to do then is go and see, are they telling you the truth about the negative consequences if this thing occurs? So is the thing occurring, and are the things that you fear it's going to result in, do you have good reason to think that it's actually going to result in that? And if you go and look at the support for the claim and the support for the negative uh, belief that negative things are going to occur, and then you go and look at the opposing information— just kind of double check yourself before you freak out that this is happening. That to me is like a great way <laughs> to to come to a conclusion about whether or not there, this is something that, that needs to freak you out. Right. right. So my I, I can't help living in Texas, but you know my main thing is the immigration thing is huge right now. Gosh, right. So they're going yeah. on about it. Yeah. So first they were like, there's this caravan. There's these seven thousand people. They're going to be coming from Honduras and El Salvador and Guatemala, and then they're going to come to the southern border of the U.S. Okay. Well, first mm-hmm. is this happening? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm seeing pictures. Well, you're seeing pictures of the Mexico border. Right. But and what not- we've learned is that the caravan has dispersed in a big way. Mm-hmm. So th- what you saw in the news is not coming to our southern border. There's like a percentage of people, surely, that are going to come to our southern border. But a lot of them have accepted asylum and are seeking asylum in Mexico. So the crowd that you saw is not what's going to come to our southern border. We're going to get a percentage of it from several hundred to potentially 1,500 of what was reported when I looked it up. is between 1,500 and 4,000 in waves. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at, you know, 1,500 being the inflated figure, like the, the big figure. Mm-hmm. And so then what, what is the, is this something that's like unprecedented? Have we not handled other caravans? Have we, and we have. Now, the thing is, there is some validity to the idea that these caravans are getting larger. And part of that has to do with increased violence in some of these right. countries. So you got more people trying to get out now. So even though we have, we, but, but it's still not like a number. When you think of 1,500 people coming to the border seeking, um, you know, m- m- wanting to migrate to the U.S., mm-hmm. and you think of our population, 1,500 people is not that many people. And we have a huge number of people that want to immigrate here. Is it really immigration or is it seeking asylum? Though? Either way. I mean, I'm just looking at it like they're coming here, they want to they want to migrate okay. into the country, however you want to describe it. But they're, okay. they're coming here and they're looking for entry into the U.S. Right. And so when I'm looking at at this thing. Okay, so we're looking at a much smaller number. So let's calm down a little bit about, <laughs> you know, who's coming here and what they're going to do. 
Then you look at like, oh, they're so violent and they're horrible. So I looked it up. I wanted to see how many deaths have occurred because of this caravan. Right. And what I found was that there were four Mexican police. And sometimes they're being, I noticed it on U.S. media, sometimes they're being called like military. Mm. But these were riot police. These were state riot police, like state, you know, Mexican state riot police Mm -hmm. that were sent there. 500 to handle all these thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Four of the riot police were injured. I couldn't get confirmation on the status of the injuries. Mm-hmm. So four riot police were injured. One person died. It was a Honduran person in the caravan who was accidentally killed when he got hit by a rubber bullet. So it was, mm-hmm. a, it was an attempt to use non-lethal Force. crowd control, but okay. it resulted in a death. Mm-hmm. So this is, you know, this was the doubt. Now, of course, you know, more people could have been injured, whatever. When you get a crowd of people that are butted up against a gate on a bridge with thousands of other people behind them pushing... I mean, you have people that are killed in stampedes at soccer matches and right. at rock shows, you know, yeah, yeah, concerts. And it's not because the people are horrible, violent killers. It's because you have a crowd of people, and sometimes when they get agitated, you're going to have some issues. And, and nobody's trying to trample someone to death. That's not the goal. It's not mm-hmm. what they're going for. It's just a, a logistic thing about numbers of people and what happens when you get a crowd that size mm-hmm. it can be a problem. So there were issues. There was some violence. There was all this other stuff, right? It's okay, there. So it's coming to the U.S. And so one of the things I heard, for example, was they come here, they seek asylum, they get they get a court date, they get released in the country, and then we never see them again. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? What he's trying to what the implication is is that they're getting into the country and then they're sort of disappearing into the United States and not coming back for the court hearing. So I would encourage people to look up the actual figures of people that return for their court hearings. And what you'll find is that you can calm down mm-hmm. yeah. because they come back for their court hearings. Now, the more we treat them with hostility, the less likely we're going to see people showing up for right. court. Because people show up for the court hearings when they're, when they're treated well. Mm-hmm. When you right. start treating people horribly, I think you might start seeing a rise in people. That It's going to be like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that is, in fact, what the numbers indicate so far. It's gone from several years ago. I think it was somewhere... Almost 90%, like yeah, 86% it was, or upwards. Of well, it was, it was actually um, several years ago, it was north of like 95% of people returned for their court hearings mm-hmm. after being apprehended at the border. And now it's down to something close to 89%, 90%. So we are actually seeing a decline yeah. in the number of people returning because they fear how they're going to be treated. Right. So then there's this thing about we've got to keep, we can't let them into the country because we, you know, you can't track these people. You've got to have these tent cities. Like we have people all the time that are on probation that we track. Right. That are not kept in tent cities. So... Is it true that the only way to track a person is by keeping them confined? No. We have ankle monitors. We have, it's like we right. have options. So this is not correct that the only way to keep track of people is by keeping them confined. Um, we do have technology that allows us to yeah. monitor people when they're not confined, and we use it all the time because we have overcrowded prisons. Mm-hmm. So you've got all these claims that are being made. And then safety, right? The sa- Oh, my gosh. Oh, the safety, mm-hmm. right? So they will show, and again, you're going to have people come in here. There's going to be all kinds of people coming into the country, and some of them are going to um, be violent people. Some of them are going to be criminals, mm-hmm. just like we have criminals here. But it's at a mm-hmm. lower rate. It's at a much lower rate. Right. So that's the other issue, right? So it's like um, when you're trying to look at who's really coming in, is it violent criminals? And the answer to that is no. Yes, you're going to have some people who are unsavory that come in when you have a mass of people coming in, If you know, you're, even if you try to vet. But even among undocumented um, immigrants, the levels of incarceration for violent crime are much lower than citizens. They're just not. It's and not it's happening. not because we can't find right. them. Sanctuary cities, <laughs> safety, much yeah. lower than average. We have great safety rates in sanctuary cities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, when you're hearing these things about, um, I remember there was one case that was really ironic to me, and I might have talked about it on this show, where it was, um, they were promoting the murder of a young woman who was killed by an undocumented immigrant in a sanctuary city. And when I looked up the case, he had been deported three times from non-sanctuary cities. Yeah. Came back to a sanctuary city, killed somebody. If it's the same guy I was thinking about, he was actually in uh, 
uh, incarcerated briefly in Maricopa County in Joe Arpaio's jail. This was now I don't know if that's the same guy or not, okay. but I did hear that one too, right? Yeah. So that was one that was on a on mm. a uh, ad recently. Oof where they were saying Democrats want this kind of violence. They're going to cause this kind of violence. They're going to support it, let these people in, let them run you know, roughshod and commit yeah. all these crimes. And it turned out that you know, Arpaio had released him. He had been allowed to come in and get married under Bush. It, and yeah. I'm, not, I'm not blaming. I'm not sitting here saying, oh, this is Republicans' fault or this is a conservative you know, fault. What I'm saying is it's ridiculous to try and Right and and p- put this on a p- on a political party because everybody's contributing to this and to say that someone was murdered in a sanctuary city by an undocumented immigrant who was released by three non-sanctuary cities so that he could keep coming back and continually be committing crimes because that's how he was caught right so he's going to these places he's committing crimes he's getting caught he's being deported and this is their solution that they're like this, the sanctuary cities need to be made to deport these people it's like well the non-sanctuary cities deported him and he came back and killed somebody right. how does that stop them, right? So in, in my mind, I would like to see a dialogue about whether deportation is actually the way to handle it or whether incarceration within the United States might be best for our safety, right? right. So, but the, but the thing is, if you're really concerned, if safety is the concern, citizens are more likely to do violent harm to you than immigrants, documented or otherwise. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's mainly about, you know, it, the argument that you'll hear is, well, they're not supposed to be here. And it's like, what's funny is if we really have higher percentages of violent crime among citizens and we could wave a magic wand and take out all of the undocumented immigrants, we've just concentrated the violence and actually made yeah. you less safe. Now, that, that's a weird thing. And I'm not, argue, I'm not arguing for undocumented status. I, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm all for let's have a humane immigration policy. Let's have, you know, sane Reasonable. immigration. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, um, policies. I'm good with that. And, and I would like for people to be able to be documented, to be able to be, you know, to report and to pay taxes and do their thing and not be in fear of deportation and not be in fear of... Well, not they pay having... their taxes. Yeah, yeah. They are I mean, but I'm just saying I would like yeah, to have right. everything right. on the table on the where table. they are, right. you know, doing what they need to do right. and working here legitimately. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm fine. The, but that, that isn't what we're really seeing right now. We're not seeing an attitude of let's make immigration humane, let's make immigration reasonable, let's go ahead, if somebody wants to come here and work and there's no reason to deny them status, let them come in, let them work, let them, you know, this is, there's all of these things we're supposed to be afraid of and the reasons that they're doing it, especially the safety issue is what's bizarre, right? Because they are statistically more safe. The only criticisms I can find of those statistics is that because people are undocumented, it may be hard to find statistics. So you have to go by things like conviction rates, um, incarceration rates, things like that, because that's when people show up. Mm -hmm. But when you look at those rates, if people are being convicted, if more citizens are convicted of violent crimes than undocumented, you know, immigrants and all immigrants combined, you know, this is, and what, what's interesting is that um, among undocumented immigrants, they're, the next generation actually starts to hit the more citizen level of violent crime. So it uh-huh. is, you know, something going on there mm-hmm. with, um, and I think a lot of people have said that it just has to do with not wanting to become visible to law enforcement when you're, right. when you're somewhere illegally. Um, keep a low profile. Yeah, you don't, you don't really want to have a run in with the police. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of just trying to keep your nose clean, do your job and go home and do mm-hmm. your stuff. And again, I understand that you're going to have outliers that makes sense. I, I don't deny that, you know, I'm not saying that there aren't any bad people in that group. I'm just saying there's more bad people in, in the citizen group. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if safety is the, but safety is not the concern here, right? It, right? I mean, that's the right. thing. It's like if this was an issue of safety, then you wouldn't be looking at immigration issues. You'd be looking at citizen safety. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's the same with um, the, the terrorism thing. You know, when people get into terrorism, it's like if you're really looking at, you know, what's killing people in this country, it's not terrorism, mm-hmm. right? It's that's very big because lots of people get killed all at once, and so it makes the news. But what kills most people in the in the country when it comes to like actions and, and wit- witting actions? I mean, we're violently murdering each other mm-hmm. um, on a daily basis, mm-hmm. and they're usually the, at least the ones that are the high profile ones that then are, are deemed mentally unstable or anti-religious or something. They're white men. Yeah. But that's, they are the, not that's the other thing, though, the, the, MO, the, the, the mental illness yeah, aspect mm-hmm. of it, right? So people will look for anything. I remember one guy where he had, like, a history of depression. And I'm mm-hmm. like, depression is not, not 
Yeah. I'm, <laughs> it doesn't it, make it, one homicidal. It, it, because somebody kills yeah. a bunch of people in a way that may disturb someone doesn't mean that because they were diagnosed with a mental illness, that the mental illness was the impetus for the violent act. But it's not even that the mental illness counts. That same act done by somebody that is has dark skin. Yes. It's yeah. terrorists. It's right. a terrorism, an act of terrorism. The definitions are not, <laughs> they're not applied consistently. And uh, getting people to see that, I haven't been able to do it. Um, I don't know if you've had any success on Facebook. No, and in fact, I, I've talked to people, you know, involving situations where you had some minority person who is very obviously mentally ill, mm-hmm. and there have been people who steadfastly refuse to recognize that as a mitigating factor for anything they might have done. You know, it's that it's not that the mental illness made them do it. It's that's just the way they are. Oh yeah, they oh, being, and hmm. you know, very similar situation with a white guy. Mm-hmm. You know, and oh, well, he, he, mental illness. Mm-hmm. You know, that was what caused him to do it. Otherwise, he's a good guy. He came from yeah, a good a family. Good you know, <laughs> Quiet no, that's, that's true. It's like if somebody's mm-hmm. yeah, if someone. Um, commits an atrocity and they're in the in the proper, I guess, demographic. Yeah. It, it was the mental illness made them do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when it's, you know, someone that suffers from PTSD, they're just they're just weak. Mm-hmm. Right? That oh, person God. is just weak and and you know, what the hell? They need a trigger warning, like what you no. Know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's so they need to just take control of that mental illness. But the person that yeah, that shoots a bunch of people and that's what's weird to me too, is there was this this thing with the mental illness and the last guy and then it then I heard talk about the death penalty and I was like Okay, so is he mentally ill or is he culpable? Yeah. <laughs> and then somebody suggested something to me, and I said, okay, that's a dark space I never even thought to go into. He's like, or are we going to start executing the mentally ill? And I was uh-huh. like, okay, thanks for bringing <laughs> that yeah. one into my nightmares yeah. because I was just thinking about the inconsistency of we're going to execute them versus we're going to say that this is because they're you know unstable. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you're basically saying, what if we're moving toward just execute unstable people? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where uh, Man in the High Castle becomes a documentary instead of a well, work of fiction. Uh, House of Cards kind of did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, uh, The truth stranger than fiction thing has been yeah. way too frequent lately. Yeah. It's it's pretty discouraging yeah. sometimes. But, I mean, since we're talking about this whole, you know, border invasion of toddlers from Guatemala, um, <laughs> you know, this whole military deployment along the border thing, uh, deploying mm-hmm. some 5,200 soldiers, uh, active duty soldiers. Um, He's floated 15,000. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Po- potentially 500 15, riot police in Mexico held back the entire batch of caravans with one accidental death. Mm-hmm. But we need 1,500 troops a, to come um, to deal with a small percentage. Five alarm fire, man. Yeah. That's a big... Which, I mean, even if it were 7,000 that they're floating, it, the whole, if the 7,000 stayed in the caravan and we got all the way to the border... We don't need even 5,000 troops to deal with that. If this were an actual invasion, um, trust me, the military can handle this. I had a question. They wouldn't send people, would they? I had a logistical question. When he's talking about military troops, is he invoking like National Guard or is he talking about— No, these are active duty military That's what I don't get. Isn't the National—what is the National Guard's role? Well, the thing is, the National Guard, those are, are state troops. They fall under the the um, command of the state governor. Weren't they called out, though, when we had election violence and stuff during civil rights? Wasn't um, it the National Guard that was National sent out? National Guard to? was mobilized um, a few times in certain places. Um, there is a precedent for the president calling up federal troops to enforce federal laws. Or, you know, it, it's very limited um, situations. So, for example... Um, in Little Rock, um, active duty soldiers were assigned to escort um, black children into the Little Rock schools when those schools were integrated because that was a federal law, and so they assigned federal troops 
to escort them in. Um, but like I said, it's very limited situations. Almost all the situations you see where you have riot stuff, it's National Guard. And part of that is that in basic training, which incidentally, Army Reserve, National Guard, and active duty soldiers all go to the same basic training. Um, you, you don't know who's who until they tell you in basic training. Hmm. Um, so it's not different. What's different is that if, for the National Guard soldiers, there's a, um, and it, it may be a little bit different now, but um, they have a riot control mission that Army Reserve and active duty don't have. Hmm. And that's because Army Reserve and active duty soldiers are federal troops. National Guard um, are considered state troops. And so they get a block of instruction on riot control procedures that the other soldiers don't get. So Uh-oh. they get called up for riots and stuff like that. Um, it's a, Like I said, it's a very limited situation. And there is law in the books that pro- prohibits the use of federal troops to enforce domestic policies. So, for example, these mm. soldiers that are going down on the border, they can't arrest anybody. They do not have arrest authority. Um, they could detain someone until Customs and Border Patrol arrives or, or you know, civilian law enforcement, but they can't actually arrest anybody. Um, they are, um, it's deeply problematic to have them armed and authorized to use deadly force against someone inside the United States. Mm-hmm. You know, that is, that is a problem. And it's actually been a problem before. There was a situation back in, I believe it was 1997, when there was the Civil War. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that whole thing. <laughs> well, there was that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. But all of this was before we had the Posse Comitatus oh. Act. But back in 1997, there were soldiers deployed along um, the U.S. southern border to assist Customs and Border Patrol with um, basically surveillance. They, they were supposed to be manning observation posts, essentially. So what happened was there was a kid, um, Escovel Hernandez, who was out um, herding his family's goats. He had a 22 caliber rifle with him um, because coyotes were yeah, a thing. First thing I thought, coyotes. Yep. And yeah, me too. So unbeknownst to him, there was a four-man Marine patrol in ghillie suits. Okay, so that's the, the suits that obscure the outline. It mm-hmm. covers them up. You can't see them. Um, they were out oh on patrol. Um, they said that Hernandez fired his rifle at them. Okay, in in the subsequent investigation, it it turned up that there was no evidence that Hernandez ever even saw them. Um, but essentially, they followed him and ended up shooting him and killing him 300 yards from his family's home. Mm-hmm. And they claimed that he was shooting at them, which made no sense at all because, again, there's no evidence that, that he um, even saw them. And the other thing is, if he had recognized them as Marines, it's unlikely he would have shot at them because in, on the wall in his bedroom was a Marine recruiting poster. He was considering joining the Marines. So um, this was a U.S. citizen who was shot and killed on U.S. soil by U.S. military in 1997 when we deployed soldiers to the southern border. Um, So these soldiers that are going, um, I looked at the list of the units that are deploying. I didn't see any combat units. There's a lot of combat support and and sustainment units, including medical units. It's way too much stuff for the probably 1,500 people that are going to show up at the border. Is somebody making money off of this? If I well, I'm sure there'll well, be a lot. paying for it, I can tell you that. Yeah, there'll be a lot of contractors who make money because uh, they're supposed to be getting support from various installations, including uh, Fort Bliss and uh, Joint Forces Base San Antonio, and then there's a few other installations um, in Arizona and California. But when you have troops out there in the field, there's going to be a lot more stuff that they'll need, and they'll hire contractors to, to build stuff. Um they're going to pay for a bunch of tents to house the people that come across the border. Big show of force. It's going to be all impressive. And and, and just supporting 
that number of troops for that length of time is very pricey. Um, I heard an estimate of something um, as much as $110 million. Um, so think about what we could do for Puerto Rico with $110 million. Wait, but those aren't Americans. But I mean, I think the thing to keep in mind, though, is this is all for show. Yeah. Right? There is no, no evidence yeah, there's no this invasion. is necessary mm-hmm. at all. Um, first of all, the, the care fans are hap- happen. We're, mm-hmm. we're used to them. We've had them before. Second of all, the numbers that they're giving you are highly inflated because this thing is dispersing. Um, what you saw in the news is not what's coming to our border. We're coming. Mm-hmm. We're getting a percentage of that, and th- you know the the violence within the group. Yeah, there's there's violence when you get a bunch of people together like that, especially when they're being held back and other people are pushing mm-hmm. forward. So mm-hmm. yeah, there was some altercations and stuff like that. Luckily, they're not not you know one mm-hmm. fatality that I could confirm. Mm-hmm. And then um, so they come here and they're going to get processed, just like every other caravan that's ever come here is going to get processed. And we've done it without the military. Mm-hmm. So this, mm-hmm. you know, just ask yourself, you know, what what's happening? Is it happening? And is it something to really be afraid of? Mm-hmm. Do yeah. I do I really need to be afraid of this? Mm-hmm. Right? And it's funny because I was thinking when I, I love my neighborhood, right? So Halloween, we had all the people coming. Mm-hmm. I mean, all the people. We had so much diversity at the door, right? Mm-hmm. Like everybody mm-hmm. coming around was different. Everyone looked different. And this one little boy came up and he had on like a, I don't know what it was, some kind of superhero costume. And I just was like, hey, what are you? And I'm giving him candy. And he says, goot, like in a kind of accented voice. And I was like, oh, what is what is that? And he's like, goot. And I look at his dad and I said, what's he saying? Mm-hmm. And dad's can't hardly speak English. And dad says to me, like gets it across to me that he the kid likes the candy. Oh, so it's oh, good. good. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. And he's just like, you know, the, you give him candy. Right. Good. You yeah. know, and I was like, oh, and uh-huh. I just started laughing and mm-hmm. gave the kid like a big handful of candy and they right. walked off. Yeah. What didn't go through my head was, damn it, why don't they speak English? Yeah. Right? Oh, right? my God. What went through yeah. my head was just the kind of hilarity yeah. of the situation yeah. and what the kid was saying and why that was yeah. funny. And, you know, it didn't. It didn't bother me at all, no. right? Mm-hmm. I, in fact, feel tremendous embarrassment over the fact that I only speak English. I, I mean, I speak a little French, time, you know. I, I, it's just I thought about I, it later. It didn't even hit me yeah. until later on, and I was thinking about how some people would be outraged by that. Yeah. Like, what is he doing here if he can't speak right. English and the kid mm-hmm. can't speak? And is that kid going to our schools? And is the kid, right. And I'm like, I just thought it was funny, mm-hmm. you know, and the kid was in his costume. I still don't know what he was. Right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. whatever. But It was good, no matter what it was. It was good. Yay. Yeah. You know, and then I just, I don't, I don't know where all this hate comes from. Uh, fear. Yeah. It's, it's, but, they're, but, the, but the people are buying into the fear real easily because they hate. Like, I don't, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like a weird cycle, and I get it. I'm not mm-hmm. trying to say, like, you know, what's the foundation of it? Like, uh-huh. what's building on what? But mm-hmm. it's almost like, they're willing to believe claims without actually just call, let's let's be calm. Let's have a look at this thing. Let's check it out. Let's see if this is really that worrisome. What is the level of threat and what is the level of response that we're bringing into this? And is this really reasonable or how afraid should I be? Mm-hmm. And they're so willing to be afraid and to immediately start to get angry and hateful in response and to react however somebody says to react. Like there's no limit to it. It's, it's almost like, you know, if someone, like what do they say? If someone throws a rock, treat it like a rifle. Yeah. And I, it, everybody took that to mean, are you saying they can open fire on people that are throwing rocks? And there were already people who had been tweeting that, oh, we should bomb the caravan. We should just go down yeah. there and kill them all. We should all, you know. And so when you're saying, like, we're going to treat, you know, somebody throwing a rock as a rifle, everybody's thinking, you just said we're going to shoot people who are throwing rocks. And so the very next day it was, no, 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 I I meant they, they should be arrested. And it's like, okay, so you were saying that if somebody starts shooting at our troops that they should just go and get law enforcement to come and arrest them because yeah yeah i, I it's, mean it's a flat even out i'm lie. not there it's right? a lie. like i as much as i want a humanitarian response i'm not going to tell people in uniform you just got to stand there and be shot at mm-hmm. right so it's right. like you're saying that you don't want our troops to 
use lethal force if someone's using lethal force against them? Because mm-hmm. that's really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Considering that yesterday it sounded like you were saying they should kill people throwing rocks mm-hmm. and everybody, and you know. And so I kind of just thought like, are the same people who supported shooting somebody who threw a rock okay with telling the military they're not allowed to defend themselves with lethal, lethal, lethal force against legitimate lethal force? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Because. Either you're okay with the one and not okay with it. It's like, how do you be, and this is like you said, if, if you watched last week's show, mm-hmm. we talked about this idea of how it's like, it's so, this is, this is okay, and then when, when the opposite is said, oh, okay, now this is okay, and literally we're talking about the next day. Mm-hmm. Right. When there's this 180 where it's okay for people to shoot you know, firearms at our troops, and they're not allowed to defend themselves in any way except go and get some law enforcement to come and arrest them. Mm -hmm. And that's acceptable, but the day before, it was acceptable for them to shoot people throwing rocks. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever the message is, it's just acceptable. Mm -hmm. And what we talked about last week was the idea of um, somebody who was releasing information that was negative about the Mormon church and how Mormon believers would react to that in a way saying, oh, this is defamation and this is Mm -hmm. lies and you're just made this stuff up and these aren't even real documents. And then they would get a removal order, like somebody to take down a takedown order from the yeah. the Mormon Church, basically saying we own the rights to these documents. Yeah. And you need to take Which them means down. It's definite, de- right? Yeah. So it was legit. Yeah. And mm-hmm. after that, what he was saying is that very few people who were critical of them for lying with these documents would come forward and say, "Oh my gosh, that's real. The Mormon Church is awful for saying such yeah. a thing or post, you know, creating such a document." Yeah. Or, and so it was like, it wasn't okay. I don't know. It, they were defending the church when they thought that this thing was horrible, when, mm-hmm. when their reaction was, this is horrible. And then when they find out it really is the church, they're still defending the church like it's not a problem. Mm-hmm. And it's just like whatever it is, whatever it switches to. And that, that shouldn't be your attitude. Like where are, where are you in there? Mm-hmm. Where is your principles? Where is your, where's your center? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and the whole, the whole principle that people should be thinking about in terms of this military response to this non-invasion is, you know, we we signed the Geneva Convention. <laughs> mm-hmm. You can't target non-combatants. You know, that's, that's not okay. It's not okay to respond with lethal force to someone, even if they throw a rock at you. That's not lethal force. You can't do that. But you'd have a hard time convincing people that they are not... Uh, dangerous, yeah. given the... Well, and, and, le- and let me just say, before people even start sending links of somebody who died because they got hit with a rock, <laughs> right? That's not really what constant. It's like you have to have a reasonable expectation that this is going to kill a person, just right. like the rubber bullet. And when I when I hear that somebody's killed with a rubber bullet, I'm not assuming that, that whoever shot that bullet was trying to murder somebody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and we are talking about, uh, you know, U.S. military troops in Kevlar, so it's unlikely that the rock will result in even any damage. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, all, all that aside, I mean, um, I was having this conversation with my wife last night, and she's like, well, have they even been throwing rocks? And I'm like, I haven't heard a single report of anybody. There, there have been some reports of rock throwing. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's, I, there's I, some I rock said, throwing. You know, but I said, even if they are, I mean, you know, it, I think it's been, like, isolated cases and everything. Yeah. She's like, so what are they worried about with the rocks? Do they, do they think they're going to swarm the border with rocks in hand and, <laughs> you know, start hurling rocks at us? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't, and that's the thing. It's like, we've, like I say, we've had these caravans come up before. Mm-hmm. Just go and look at how we've handled them in the past and see if that's scary. Yeah. Right? Like, see if you read about how we process immigrants at our, at our border when they come up through with these caravans. And then just ask yourself, is this something I need to be terrified with that we need to call out the military to protect me? And, you know, see, yeah. see what you think. I'm sitting here thinking I'm, we're going home for the holidays um, on uh, for Christmas. And uh, my in-laws, they're all um, folks who would be afraid of immigrants and that sort of thing. And I'm formulating in my head the sorts of things that I want to ask them about because I can have certain conversations with them about oh, these sorts I mean, of things. Mm-hmm. My husband can't because they do come back to court. They don't just disappear. Right. right? Yeah. They're not so, violent. What, what as, exactly? I mean, from a, from a, if, if, if we're willing to accept the levels of citizen violence yeah. that we accept, we certainly don't have anything to fear from them as far as violence. Right. Um, 
they they tend to just I mean and I don't this is it almost sounds like a racial stereotype but living in Austin and just seeing when I when I encounter people who have difficulty with English that I know are Hispanic and mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. construction lawn maintenance someone mm-hmm. making a bed in a hotel or doing other service work like back of a kitchen you know mm-hmm. right this is this is what they're what they do here right mm-hmm. they come here and they take these jobs and they live in large groups in a house because they they the, uh, those jobs don't pay well so you need to have a large group of people in order to pay your rent but i mean they they come here they go to the day labor place i mean they're looking for work yeah. and they're working and that's all they're doing is is service jobs and not like that but it's actually it, they're beneficial to the local economy because almost every dollar they make goes right back into the economy they have no yeah. choice they go shopping it. <laughs> yeah they go they go buy food right you know mm-hmm. they pay rent they they pay for transportation. It's not like, you know, they um, sequester a chunk of money yeah. in a bank account I mean, and never there, there reinvest are, it. Yeah, and there are, mm-hmm. I mean, there are, are some instances when people, people are right sending money back to family and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. You know, that does happen because not sure. sometimes one person from the family will come here and they're they're trying to help their family back home. Totally. Under, but, you know, there's, there's nothing, they're not, there's nothing horrible about what they're doing. There's no, right. like, horrible, malicious plot to, like, harm people or defraud the U.S. Or I mean, these are people that if you told them, hey, how about if, if uh, you sign this document and we'll, we'll call it legal, I think most of them would be like, sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not, they're not, <laughs> they're not scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, in, in, uh, regarding that sending money home, you know, to, to people who are outside the country, it's really kind of ironic to me that the same people that will claim that being able to give your kids $5 million, you know, right. in tax free, tax free <laughs> is just outrageous. It's not enough. You know, you should be able to give all your money tax free to your kids. But they'll have a cow over somebody sending, you know, a couple hundred bucks back to their relatives, mm-hmm. you know, in Mexico. Mm-hmm. It's like... It, it, the response is just disproportionate and to I, the impact. I also on wanted the to talk for a minute about, like, when I was little in Florida, there was a big thing on water safety, right? Mm-hmm. Because you grow up in Florida, there's water everywhere. Yeah. And one of the things they told us as kids was, don't jump in after a drowning person, you know, because kids see somebody right. in trouble, they don't know. So you jump in after a drowning person, what happens? That person's going to climb all over you. Yeah. Um, they're panicked and they're going to kill you. They're not going to kill you because they're a horrible, malicious killer. They're going to kill you because they're freaked out, they're desperate, they're panicking, and you are on top of the water, which they're trying to get above. Yeah. So this is, you know, don't jump in um, unless you really are sure you could take this person down yeah. when they are fighting you at their worst. <laughs> don't jump in after them. The what you have to do is look for something that can float. Try to throw them something that can float, something that you that you mm-hmm. can pull them in, like something, you know, do what you can. But jumping in, you're probably going to end up killing yourself and them. Mm-hmm. So when you're smaller than someone else, not sure you can actually take that. And there's some people that have argued, like, wait until they go unconscious and then get them out, say, right? Yeah. I mean, so, it, but <laughs> oh, the thing is, it doesn't do little. any good to put yourself in danger mm-hmm. yeah. trying to help somebody else and then you both die. So this is how they taught it when I was in Florida. So the idea is when somebody's desperate, you don't want to be between them and safety. Right. When you put yourself between them and the air, right, mm-hmm. you're going to lose because they are going to climb all over you literally to get to the, to the air that because they Because they need. literally have nothing right. to lose. So right. I was posting some information on um, situations in Gu- Guatemala because I have an acquaintance that does work there as an anthropologist. And so I was, um, I'm familiar with their, their situation. There's a lot of military repression in Guatemala, there's a lot of military abuse, um, and there's a lot of history of it. There's history of people being conscripted into military. Mm. There's you know all kinds of situations with rape and with and it's especially against indigenous populations. So when you think about the United States and the abuses that we uh, shoveled out onto the indigenous populations here in the United States, think about things like that. Put it into modern weapon. Uh, context and understand that this is happening and still mm-hmm. against indigenous populations in some of these places where they are still taking the land and still pushing them off and still not really respecting their rights to utilize anything and, and to live. Mm-hmm. So for a lot of these folks, the specter of military is threatening mm-hmm. yeah, and comes along with a lot of really, really ugly baggage that is understandable when you start to read about what it is they've dealt with and there are long histories of how they've been massacred. And how, I mean, she dealt with massacre reparations. 
So this was and this this is current. You know what I mean? These are current things, and um, lots of humanitarian groups are involved in this, and we'll post information so you know it's easy to find. But my point was, when these people are just coming here and they're looking for help because they're escaping that kind of violence and that kind of partially military violence, and they come here, and then you want to put troops in uniforms between them and safety and then say, if you so much as throw a rock. It's a perfect setup. You're mm-hmm. trying to instigate, what, yeah. you know, or, or you're, you're potentially instigating, whether you're trying or not, a really bad situation to frighten somebody who's already drowning. Mm-hmm. Right? You, you don't want to throw them an anchor, and you don't want to climb in there with them. You want to find something that helps them float and get them that. Mm-hmm. That's the best method, not to escalate. You don't want to escalate the situation. And that's what we're seeing here is escalation of a situation, which is almost a challenge to the people that are coming in to not get violent or to get mm-hmm. violent. Like, like, just, you know, I dare you. Right. Dare you to throw a rock. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a bad mix. Yeah. It's, it is asking for trouble, and escalation is the perfect word. It, it, that comes to mind with many interactions I have with folks who won't pay attention to the data that show that um, the people who want to come across are actually coming from bad circumstances. They want to come here because they are good people. They, they yeah. want to start a new life. Uh, they ignore data that, that show that, say, women's wages are 75% of men's, all of these things, and, and there's always the escalation where instead of just discussing yeah. it, it goes to 11. I mean, in, in Guatemala, that's mm-hmm. where you hear the word disappeared. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Thousands mm-hmm. of people just disappeared. Mm-hmm. Um, they just they get taken away one night and no one ever sees them again. Yeah. You know, they have literally government hit lists mm-hmm. where humanitarian workers can't come there, where human rights lawyers are afraid to put boots on the ground because this is dangerous for yeah. people that are trying to help these Indians. Right. And... It, it really is a scary situation. I mean, when you know people that have gone there and have tried to work there and have tried to help and you hear the stories, you're just sort of like, wow, this is a, tr- this is a train wreck. Well, and then when you have someone who finally makes a decision, look, I just can't live here anymore. I have to leave because, yeah. you know, I'm going to die, my kids are going to die or whatever. And they make this long trek all the way to the U.S. border only to be apprehended and basically incarcerated in a tent city possibly yeah. separated from their kids, mm. and then later told, uh, well, if you want your kids back, you've got to sign away your right yeah. to... And you have translation issues. Yeah. So please know that the people coming out of Guatemala, not all of them are speaking Spanish. Right. Right. There are people who speak Spanish that go to work in these countries who have to have translators to talk to, like, the Keche Maya, and it, that, yeah. that there are indigenous populations who do not speak English, and they do not speak Spanish. They speak yes. other dialects. And so you've got these issues with translation that happen. The idea that all of Central and South America speak Spanish, it doesn't, yeah. right? It mm-hmm. doesn't. Oh, it's, it's broken up, and there are indigenous dialects that yeah. you have to deal with. Yeah. yeah. But then, you know, you, you get somebody that basically get they get herded into a tent city, um, and then at some point they get some hearing, and, and then they are summarily deported back to wherever they started. And it's like... How can you, how can you do this to another human being? What are they going to do? Because they left everything they had behind. Yeah. Because they had no other choice, and now you've put them right back in that situation where they're now even more vulnerable than they've ever been before. It's almost like a death sentence. In fact, for a, for lot, a lot of, of people, them, I think it, is. It, it is. Yeah. This is a death sentence. And I, I mean, I just well, I don't people know get how. angry, and they're just like, "Oh, you're saying our policies are killing people," and it's like, they yeah, I know. Yeah, are. I mean, yeah. you shouldn't be afraid, but you should be angry. I mean, and the thing is, it's like, okay, military on the board, I, and I come back to this, but it's like, it's a disproportionate response based on fear, a fear that is not well founded at all. And out of all this. Like I said, you should be angry. And if you're not angry about the humanitarian part of it, be angry about the military readiness part of it. Because a big chunk of these troops, they're coming from the 82nd Airborne Division or 18th Airborne Corps troops. This has historically been our quick reaction force. If something happens in the world and we need to be there like tomorrow, this is the unit that does it. These people are going to be sitting on the southern border now instead of training for their actual mission, which is to be wheels up on the way to somewhere else in 24 hours or less. 
if you're not pissed off about that, I don't even know what to say to you. Because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sitting here about to burst into flames over this. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have better knowledge of that than all of us, but what that actually means. And, and that, that you're scared and that pissed scares me. Well, well the thing that so. pisses, the, the thing that really scares me about this, because, I mean, I have confidence in the military commanders to, to basically learn from our mistakes of the past where we've actually shot an American citizen. Um, I, I have confidence that they're going to have um, the proper rules of engagement in effect for the troops so that we can not have another situation like that. What I'm concerned about is that there's all these patriot militias that are converging down there to assist. Mm -hmm. And those assholes have no military training. They don't recognize military authority. They don't think the Geneva Convention's a good idea at all, so they don't care. Mm. Those guys are a risk. They're a risk to commit atrocities down there, to kill people with impunity, um, and then there's a lot of uh, military units who've, who've come right out and said, hey, we're worried that these guys are going to steal our gear. And Thanks. that's a risk. Right. So then you're going to have military-grade equipment in the hands of, you know, these unregulated militias. Okay, so probably if they're watching, people are saying, what the hell can I do besides bitch about it on Facebook? Well, <laughs> we have elections coming. Yeah, we have elections. Well, we don't we'll, have elections coming. They just happen. This is a post-election yeah, show. Yeah, this will be a post-election oh. show. But you can oh. still talk to your elected representative, re- representatives. <sighs> write to your senators. Write to your congressmen. Write to anybody. Write letters to the editor. Um, put your voice out there. Let people yeah. know this is not okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And fill it with actual data. Yeah. You know, put the percentages of people that show up for court hearings. Put the percentages of people that commit violent crimes versus citizens that commit violent crimes. But, you know, show show what you're saying. Look it up. You know, find out whether or not... But just, gosh, this, this absorption of fear without people even knowing. You know, it's like, what are you afraid is going to happen? When they start telling you, it's like, there's no evidence that's going to happen. There is no evidence for this. All of our past history with it has not been that. Mm-hmm. So don't just believe something. You know, go and check it. If something, sca- especially if it scares you, if you hear something that scares you, go and look into it. M- inform yourself more. And if it still scares you after you get informed, then like Jen is saying, make a, make a fuss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Like make sure other people understand what's going on and why you think it should be scary. Mm-hmm. And I will say, I, I know that there have been times in my life where, where I thought that writing letters and that sort of thing had no impact. But I have been doing this political game and the fighting for issues long enough to know that it does have an impact yes. if the voice is loud enough and if your timing is good. Just count on the timing being as good as possible if you can write and do write there is always that chance that you can have an impact. Don't give up. I know it's awfully hard in this political atmosphere that we've yeah. got right now, but I haven't, and I've been writing and doing and whatever as much as I can. I have to take breaks sometimes. I'm sure everybody here has had to take a break. You have to get away from social media for a bit and regroup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. My Facebook feed is just like rage, rage, rage funny cat video. <laughs> rage, rage, rage. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yes, I get it. Uh, but do get back in there and don't give up because we we, we do have an impact here and there and uh, it's a big deal. Um, coming up soon, uh, January 19th or something, I think, is the um, Women's March in Austin. Oh, wow. Uh, and I've been talking to our producer about filming there live. Ah, that'd be okay. cool. At, at the that would be really cool to oh. interview some people. I yeah. Think that is an awesome idea. Yeah, I think that'd yeah. be super cool. So, yeah, I, I probably... And maybe be even to... interview some counter-protesters. Oh, God. Cause... I'm not sure I want to give them a platform. I don't know about it. Depends. I, it, I mean, I've seen some of the counter-protesters. I'm not sure it's a platform. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? It's like, so, so what you're saying is there's a difference between... Sometimes they're their own worst PR. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so much is true. So, yeah, the, uh, the exposure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Speaking of women, yeah. um, there was a panel of, what is it? I think it was like um, 
eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight or nine. Oh, like, the eight black women. Yeah. Yes. So there has been oh, like yes. an unprecedented number of like black candidates mm-hmm. um, and elect people being elected. And so there were like several that were interviewed recently. And these are, you know, it's all black women on the panel. Um, obviously, we've seen, you know, some some black candidates who are men like, um, you know, Gillum in Florida at the governor's level, stuff like that. And let's see, this was eight of the 20 women who won election to local or state offices in in the county in past August, in the county in past, this past August. So that was Memphis in Shelby County. So they are just hooking it up um, in Shelby County. And and, uh, apparently the um, 20 women and at least eight eight of them who were black and appeared on MSNBC recently on a panel. And that was just, wow. Right on. You know, and I was watching it. And then part of me was thinking like one of the talking points you hear a lot is, oh, you know, black unemployment is down, black unemployment is down. And it's like, if you're one of the people that um, celebrates the low black unemployment figure and you don't celebrate black people being elected to office, Mm -hmm. think about what it is you're actually saying. Yeah, Mm -hmm. definitely. Other articles that y'all have? Um, yeah, there was one that um, actually I think Tracy had posted this on the Godless Bitches website as well about uh, Saudi Arabia executed an Indonesian maid. I saw who mm-hmm. um, she killed her or the guy that was raping her, and so they killed her. Um, so people wonder why I loathe the Saudis. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that's one of the reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That would be a pretty good reason. Right yeah. There. Somebody on the um, on the, the website um, or on the, the Godless Bitches Facebook page had asked, um, but doesn't Indonesia have Sharia law as well? And the answer is only in Aceh province. And that was basically, there, there was like a civil war thing going on there. And I'm probably butchering this. But anyway, um, allowing Aceh to have Sharia law was basically a, um, an act of appeasement toward that province mm-hmm. so they wouldn't break away. Mm-hmm. And so now in if you're in Aceh province, you can be beaten for violating the dress code or for behaving immodestly or whatever. And they are now trying to spread that crap to other parts of Indonesia. Okay. So the lesson here is don't appease these extremists in any sense. They won't be appeased. Because it, that that does, appeasement doesn't work. Mm-mm. It does not work. Oh, I did have... Um, I saw something else, and it kind of ties into some other things. But um, one of the one of the issues that I thought about when it was, um, you know, the rock throwing, it's just like a rifle, right? That got mm-hmm. stressed. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just like an offhand comment. Like, he went mm-hmm. on and on about right. rock throwing is like a rifle. And I kind of laughed and said, I wonder if the people who support the Second Amendment would be okay with a gun ban if they're still allowed to own rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that got me was... The way that the Second Amendment is held up um, for gun rights, which I just, you know, for the record, that is something I respect. I think mm-hmm. that if uh, if there's something in the Constitution and you want to change it, there is an amendment process. Mm-hmm. So I totally, totally get that if the nation comes together and we decide that it's time to alter and update, you know, I, I'm down with it. I'm not saying that it's like immutable document. Mm-hmm. But I am going to say that before we would start stripping people of rights, it would should take some thought, right? This isn't something that you should do lightly. You shouldn't say, like, I'm going to sign an executive order and mm-hmm. just amend the Constitution with it mm-hmm. because it doesn't work that way. It's There's a reason that it's not an easy thing to do, right? Because yeah. you don't want to start taking your rights away. So if you support the Second Amendment and you are comfortable with striking down the 14th Amendment, you might be a hypocrite. Mm-hmm then please don't use the Second Amendment as any kind of basis for any of your rights when you don't, when if you're not tweeting and angry and, and um, responding to the 14th Amendment attack, um, if, if that's okay with you, then STFU regarding uh, your Second Amendment right. Because if that's what you think of an amendment, if that's how lightly you take these rights, especially a right to citizenship, um, then don't don't use the Constitution as as the foundation of your argument. Mm-hmm. Forget your rights if you're going to forget everybody else's. And for the record, 
how I started this was to say that that's why I take the Second Amendment seriously, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't sit there and strike either. I would be willing mm-hmm. to listen to a public dialogue on striking either, mm-hmm. but what I don't expect is for the either to come down easily because that document should not be easily adjusted. Right. And so the other thing that made me think um, when it came to the 14th Amendment discussion that we're having recently and for people that haven't followed it or haven't been watching the news, basically it's the idea of if you're born in the United States, you are a U.S. citizen. The end. That's the beginning. Ah, That's the but end. wait. So there's this you know, question now of whether or not you should be allowed to be born in the United States and be a U.S. citizen, and there's a lot of really weird irrationality around this thing. So part of the arguments that people use, these these historically people have referred to this loosely as like what they call an anchor baby. Mm-hmm. So they'll say women come you know, across the border uh, undocumented, they have a baby, and then that baby has all these U.S. entitlements as a citizen that it shouldn't have, right? And it doesn't deserve because she shouldn't have been here. And, mm-hmm. and, and then... She's going to use this baby later, and she's going to gain citizenship because of this chain migration crap. And, you know, we're you know, totally—so it's the chain migration, and it's the entitlements that you didn't deserve because you just got born here. Your parents aren't citizens. You didn't, but wait! You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? So here's the thing. Oh, my God. There's something called birth tourism. Yeah. hmm Yeah. And what happens with birth tourism is that people come here legally to have a baby— Mm-hmm. so that they can have a U.S. citizen capacity, right? Mm-hmm. So they're basically coming here on vacation, having a baby that is going to have U.S. citizen entitlements and is going to then be able to be used for chain migration. And literally all of these abuses that piss people off when it's a Hispanic woman coming from South or Central America mm-hmm. um, don't piss people off now. Because yeah. these women that are doing the birth tourism predominantly are white. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so this is okay, you know. And I do get, you know, there's this distinction. So somebody could say, well, but I, you know, my problem is that you're getting all these things illegally and not legally because you weren't documented when you came through. And it's like, okay, then let's talk about legal and illegal status. And you can STFU about the baby getting entitlements and why if it was just born here because that's all her baby did was just get born here. Yeah, right. I don't care if she's here on vacation. I don't, you know, and, and in fact, that's all I did was just get born here. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I, in fact, I didn't even get born here, mm-hmm. right? I got born somewhere else, but my parents were U.S. citizens, so I just got it and I didn't have to be born here, mm-hmm. right? I, but I did nothing to mm-hmm. inherit my citizenship. Yep. Yep. And so there's no merit to it. Right? There, this isn't a merit thing. This baby being born here on vacation versus a baby born here because somebody got across our border, neither of those children is any more deserving of citizenship. Neither of them has done jack crap to gain citizenship. Neither of their parents have been living here paying taxes and putting in. It's like neither of them mm-hmm. are have, you know, literally they just got into the country, gave birth to the baby, and now they're in the same status. And if your problem is with the, the immigration status, and whether it's legal or illegal, that's fine. But don't start bitching about the baby getting entitlements. It doesn't, because this other baby doesn't deserve it either. Mm-hmm. And don't start bitching about the chain migration aspect of it, because you don't care if it's a white woman who gets it. Mm-hmm. You really right. don't care. This isn't about, you know, somebody on vacation deserves all this stuff. How the hell does being here on vacation give you, like, deserving yeah. it? And yet the way this law would be written, the, the white women doing this would still be protected, but only those people who are not wealthy enough or can't get the funds together to get here in a legal way, um, those would be the ones that would be punished, and that's most often going to correspond to being, you know, somebody from Central or South America um, and it just reminds me of those laws, right? The literacy laws for voting or the poll taxes, uh, right? Yeah, Where mm-hmm. it's like any obstruction. Yeah, that- yeah, it's like this isn't about being black. This is just we love reading. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, that's the ticket. Yeah, so you just yeah. grab these things that are going to correspond right. to, you know, the races you want to discriminate mm-hmm. against, and you just say, well, let's parse the law so that only they get squeezed out. Mm-hmm. But but the white people can still squeeze in, which is exactly what they did in North Dakota with the voting. Um, laws oh, God. saying you have to have a residential yeah. street address in order to on your ID oh, in yeah. order to vote. That was, well, and the people who lived on the reservations 
can't right. have anything it, but a post office box. It used to box. say, now, the, right. the, the, this so. was a rule where it was like, they, it used to say a valid mailing address. Right. And that was for, what state are we talking about? North Dakota. Was it North Dakota? Yeah. I know I posted it. So, yeah. Yeah, so they had a rule that you, if you had a valid mailing address, you could come and vote. They decided to change it to a valid street address, and that just eliminated everybody living on the reservations because right. they don't use street addresses. So, bam, mm-hmm. you don't get to vote if you're Native American and you're on the reservation. Um, that was one of the posts. That, and then we, I had this thing with um, Tanzania, I guess, is amping up its... Or is it... Yeah. 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 About amp- the reporting people who are gay. Yeah. Yeah. That was just wild. Um, so it's like 30 years to life for being gay in Tanzania, and yeah. they've put out a call for information. Hey, report your friends and family and fellow citizens if you think they're gay, because uh, we're going to go out and talk to them, start rounding them up. Yeah, I'm sure they're, um, they'll do a thorough and fair investigation and get only the people who've offended in some way and not you know, innocent people just living their lives who happen to be maybe a business rival of the guy who outed them. I don't know. Mm. Wow. Well. Because, you know... What could possibly go wrong with? But a this is like another that. thing where it's just like, <laughs> right. what do you fear? Yeah, where, where people this this shouldn't escalate to this level. Putting right. somebody in jail for thirty years for being gay, you just need to kind of everybody stop and take a deep breath here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you know what are they doing, and what do you think is going to happen, and do you have good reason to think that these horrors that you anticipate are going to happen, and is that a bad thing? Yeah, is that a bad well, thing? Where did this come from? Uh, I know that a lot of the homophobia that's in Africa has been transplanted by missionaries from the U.S. Mm-hmm. Is this one of those instances? Or? I, I think most of uh, the, the globe, when it comes to um, nations in Africa, or, you know, even it, it's just been sort of um, Europeanized, right? Like this was all yeah. a lot of uh, British Empire, France. Mm-hmm. Um, Spain, all kind of, and even Portugal, I guess, to some degree, sort of colonized the whole globe mm-hmm. yeah. at some point and, mm-hmm. and had this kind of influence. And then we, as a nation, have been exporting more extreme uh, Christian sects, it's more extreme Christian doctrines yeah. and dogmas. Yeah. I think sort of the, the global panic over, um, over AIDS back in the Mm. 80s, really sort of accelerated the crap that was going on in Africa with missionaries Mm -hmm. pushing out this negative thing. And the Catholic Church had like a widespread campaign against condoms in Africa Mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's one more reason that the Catholic Church really has blood on its hands Mm -hmm. when it comes to just kind of all the things they've done that have directly harmed people. Well, here's what's freaking them out. Like, here's a quote from the article. So this is... The governor of Tanzania's largest city, um, who says, I have received reports that there are so many homosexuals in our city, and these homosexuals are advertising and selling services on the internet. And that hurts people. Huh? <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know why that's a problem. Yeah. Or you could just go on Grinder and get it for free. I don't even know that he's uh, being specific to like sexual services. It's yeah. Just, you know, they're, they're out. Um, yeah, if they're baking cakes, I mean, how is this? You know any gays? Report them to me. Ugh. You know, <sighs> it's just this is just wild. Yeah. Okay. Does that wrap it up for all the uh, yeah news and the hickeys? <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Um, I wanted to finish with something that I read on the. Uh, on Facebook. It's one of those things that gets passed around, and I think it's important. Uh, When Frances Perkins was a little girl, she asked her parents why nice people could be poor. Interestingly, um, are you familiar with Alain de Baton? I'm not. Uh, He is... um, I'm watching his videos and eating them like M&Ms. A-L-A-I-N D-E-B-O-T-T-O-N He's... uh, my kind of atheist, and he talks about um, all sorts of moral issues, ethical issues, art, all sorts of fantastic things. And this reminds me of one of his things because he talks about uh, um, 
how we define people who are successful as being good and, and deserving it, which means that if people are poor, they are bad and don't deserve, deserve it. it. Yeah, and then they don't deserve <laughs> whatever deserve they get, right? Or, yeah. yeah. So, so, okay, so she's asking this very good question. She asked her parents why nice people could be poor. Her father told her not to worry about those things and that poor people were poor because they were lazy and drank. Eventually, she went to Mount Holyoke College and majored in physics. In her final semester, she took a class in American economic history and toured the mills along the Connecticut River to see working conditions. She was horrified. Eventually, instead of teaching until she married, she earned a master's degree in sociology from Columbia University. In 1910, Perkins became executive secretary of the New York, New York City Consumers League. She campaigned for sanitary regulations for bakeries, fire protection for factories, and legislation to limit the working hours for women and children in factories to 54 hours per week. She worked mainly in New York State's capital, Albany. Here she made friends with politicians and learned how to lobby. This is in the early 1900s, and this is a woman, and I, that's just awesome. In March, on March 25th, 1911, Frances was having tea with friends when they heard fire engines. They ran to see what was happening and witnessed one of the worst workplace disasters in U.S. history. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire was devastating, killing 146 people, mostly young women and girls. Frances watched as fire escapes collapsed and firemen's ladders couldn't reach the women trapped by the flame flames. She watched 47 workers leap to their deaths from the 8th and ninth floors. Poignantly, just a year after these same women and girls had fought for and won the 54-hour work week and other benefits that Frances had championed. These women weren't just tragic victims. They were heroes of the labor force. Frances, at that moment, resolved to make sure their deaths meant something. A committee to study reforms in safety and factory, in factories was formed, and Perkins became the secretary. The group took on not only fire safety, but all other health issues they could think of. Perkins, by that time, a respected expert witness, again, a woman in the early 1900s, expert witness, that's pretty awesome. She must have been a formidable person. This is the sort of person when they say, who do you want to sit down, living or dead, and have lunch? <laughs> you say like, living. Yeah, yeah, li li yeah. <laughs> you want to be living. And, yeah, right. Yeah. She's one of those people. She helped draft the most comprehensive set of laws regarding workplace health and safety in the country. Other states started copying New York's new laws to protect workers. So she's kind of at the foundation of how uh, work how places of work are run. Perkins continued to work in New York for decades until she was asked by President-elect Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1933 to serve as Secretary of Labor. 1933. Woman Secretary of Labor, badass. She told him only if he agreed with her goals, 40-hour work week, minimum wage, unemployment, and workers' compensation, abolition of child labor, 1933. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My dad was born in 1933. Federal aid to the states for unemployment, Social Security, a revitalized federal employment service, and universal health insurance. Bada bing, bada boom, she wanted all that. Mm -hmm. He agreed. Uh, I don't know where the universal health insurance went, but yeah. it was in there at one point. Anywho, he agreed. Similar to what she had worked for in New York, her successes became the New, the new Deal. She was the person behind the New Deal. Interesting. And changed the country and its workers forever. So while you may not know her name, you certainly know her legacy. That's one of those people in history whose name you need to remember, Frances Perkins. All right. Lift a cup. All right. Thank you so much, Jen and Tracy. Thank you. This Thank was, you. as always, very enlightening and um, not always fun, but good stuff for people to know about. Thank you to the guys on the other side of the wall over there who actually make this thing go. Yay. And thank you to you for watching. Do hit that subscribe button, please. And we also have a Patreon if you want to support what we do in that fashion. We want to leave you with this final thought. We don't need a savior. We have each other. It's all we've ever had and all we'll ever need. Bye. Mm -hmm.